sorry if I cut somebody off there. I had forgotten to disconnect the Wi-Fi. And you'll also notice another little problem that I'm not using the gimbal. So I want you to say a little prayer that I just realized now that it fell out of my pocket yesterday and I didn't realize that I lost the magnetic piece that is fixed to the gimbal. And that's what holds the phone. And it's, it's connected by a magnet and I didn't realize when it fell out of my pocket that that piece had come off. So I hope to be able to find it again, God willing. So what we saw yesterday in the distance, we're seeing here really close up. So we have all these cormians coming for breakfast and some little fish are going to be their breakfast. And they're just, I, I don't know if there are thousands here, but there are definitely many, many hundreds of these birds and they're still coming in. Look at them coming in. And there'll probably be more coming in. So we'll just stay here quietly because you remember yesterday, I had that big umbrella over me and I think they got scared and then they lifted. I'm not sure if that was, the, no, that was actually, I'm not sure if that was in the Instagram. I think that was in the Instagram. And they all lifted up at that moment. It was amazing, tremendous noise. And now we have a better perspective because we see how they're spread out. And they're going to absolutely screen all that water and clear out all the little fish. So that's the upper end of them here and down there, stretch all the way down here. I wonder if they're just fishing or they're just having their general assembly here. That was often a question I had, so maybe I was giving you wrong information. Maybe they're just arriving here for their annual Congress. This happens usually at this time of the year, January, February. Sorry about the instability of the camera. We're missing the gimbal, so that helps us to appreciate what we have. Many times we don't realize what we have until we lose it, especially relationships. I'm trying to stretch the screen and it's not stretching for me. Oh, there it is. Ah, it was fully stretched, that's why. <laughs> so that's them at a distance. And they're actually not gobbling at all. Maybe they're gathering for a moment of silent prayer. So yeah, they're very quiet. I wonder what's the what's the reason for this? Amazing, isn't it? Well, let's go to the readings. Today we have very special readings. That. It's amazing how uh, putting a few readings together, it captures the whole mystery of, of salvation. And there's a combination of two events that are very far apart, maybe 1600, 1700 years or more. And they're intimately, deeply connected. And this connection is actually originally given by Jesus himself to the disciples. And we're talking about Abraham and the Jewish people call it the binding of Isaac. It's such a heart-rending account that raises so many questions for us if we don't know enough of biblical and social background of the time. A 
And then we have the Transfiguration and Mount Tabor. But actually all of the readings today have an extraordinary uh, fact that every single one of them, even the verse before the gospel, has one word that's shared by all of them. Maybe some of you have been looking at it already, since you can always get to the link very easily by just hitting the arrow on the top from yesterday's readings and it'll take you to today's readings. And you could check through what's the common word in every single reading today. And that common word is son, our beloved son, our your son, or my son, every single one. The psalm has it, the first reading has it, the second reading has it, the verse before the gospel has it, and the gospel itself. And there are two sons concretely mentioned, two different sons, and therefore two different fathers, and there's a third one intended. And that third one is you and me. And then actually there's a relationship for us also in the father role for everybody in the parent role take your son the most precious you have in the world more valuable than your house more valuable than your extraordinary gold-plated car more valuable than all your corporation that you own, no matter how big and multinational it is, your son. And this son is your future because he is the connection to the fulfillment of the promise that you will be a father of great nations, of many nations. And then there's a whole context here that sounds very revolting for us today, even though we're just as involved in it today as ever before in humanity. Humanity had a lot of problems once Adam and Eve left their paradise. And the problem started when they turned from God. And how you can get back to God. It's like you break a leg, sorry for that ugly image. And you probably know the work it takes through some friend of yours, somebody that had to be hospitalized for six months and now has completely degenerated muscle and it has to be rebuilt. How do you rebuild it? And you know the excruciating pain of rehabilitation and the constant effort of rehabilitation. For months, and some rehabilitation might even go much longer. Speech therapy, when people have lost their speech. The biggest therapy that has to be rehabilitated is our return to God. That's the biggest trauma for humanity, our brokenness from God. The biggest wound, the word trauma means wound. And our relationship with God for humanity, let's talk in terms of all of humanity, has been deeply wounded. Because we took what is not ours. Do you notice how the water is up? on this final platform. I just thought I'd come down and step on it because probably it'll be the last day we can do that. 
actually it's coming in all the way with the little waves here and you remember there were two more steps outside this and then another level there was the plat another platform about the size of this one a little smaller maybe so i'm just going to go down here hoping it won't come into my tennis shoes my walking shoes coming in but it's like not high enough to get into me so here you are walking in the water in the Sea of Galilee now it's up almost to the completely to the corner over there and I didn't look at the measurement so I'm not sure how the measurement is right now but it's definitely in the one meter range from maximum level. You can see the marker on the wall over there. That whiter part, spot on the second part of the wall. This, there's one one here right here within the next wall over there. And you can see a white line on it. And that's maximum level. Lots of little shells down there. So back to our topic. So we're at Mount Tabor with the Peter, James and John and Jesus and there's a cloud and that goes back to the cloud that covered the people coming out of slavery. And the cloud is God's presence. And there's a voice from the cloud and Jesus is flanked by Moses and Elijah, which means Moses means the first five books of the Bible. So the whole story, the whole process, not just a story, a process that God has taken the people through from the beginning of humanity right up to Abraham. And from Abraham right through Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, Egypt. And then the slavery in Egypt and then the liberation from Egypt and then ready to enter the promised land and then the prophets well the prophets are the voice of God for all the leaders of the people setting up the kingdom Saul and David right up to then you could say John the Baptist so when you have Moses and Elijah flanking Jesus, you have the entire scriptures. And that's said in many ways throughout the Gospels and the New Testament. And uh, it's said how Jesus fulfills the scriptures. That's connected to that. It, it's said in uh, the conversation Jesus has with the two disciples on Easter Sunday evening on the way to Emmaus. And he interprets for them all that applied to him from the scriptures. So this community of Jewish people who gathered around Jesus and followed him one by one, they understood and gave us the New Testament as a written record of how they understood the mystery of Jesus and is completely expressed in all that history. So there in one little photograph, if you will, one little iconic image, we have Moses and Elijah flanking Jesus, making that statement without words. Just with the visual, it says it all. Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, the utmost total reliance on God, because God had promised that he would receive many nations as his heirs, and that was through Isaac. And now he had to sacrifice Isaac. There's so much here to ponder and think about, 
It's in a culture when humanity was trying to return to God and did many crazy things. I mean, the maximum expression of the craziness was the sacrifice of their own children in fire. And it's very interesting, I think, just as a general interpretation to say that with the rise of monotheism, with the rise of the re-entry into the relationship with the one true God, we see the ending of human sacrifice. And there are numbers of references in the Psalms. Let's say Psalm 106. And in the prophets, Jeremiah, I think it's 19 and 31, in Isaiah, in all the prophets of the time of the exile, they're condemning the people for reverting to human sacrifice like the pagans in Jerusalem itself. And that's why the Valley of Gehenna has its stench, its moral stench. These are big, big themes. And God says, do not take the child's life. What went on in Abraham's soul up to that point? And the first thing we can see is extraordinary obedience to God, extraordinary acceptance of God, letting God be God, letting God rule my life. The willingness to forfeit everything to allow God to be God. That's extraordinary. And in a sense, spiritually, we all have to develop this maturity spiritually to let God be God in our lives. And even in the things that God provides that seem to be how I'm going to succeed, I can even lose that. And I can still succeed with God. It's that faith, that's an incredible authenticity in the core of our heart when we reach that level of spiritual maturity. To let God be God. And this is why Abraham is our father in faith. And God says, do not touch the child. I will provide the sacrifice. And for the moment, the first interpretation is the lamb in the bush that's caught in the bush. And I just learned something yesterday that I didn't know about in Jerusalem from Kathleen's video and her interview with the Greek Orthodox Bishop about the Our Father, in case you missed it yesterday. And there she comments how they have a memory of the bush there at the Greek Orthodox monastery. And just even if we just go minimally, it's worth a memory in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is considered by Jewish tradition to be the place where Abraham offered Isaac, where he bound Isaac for the potential offering in the sacrifice. So that's, that's very uh, fascinating. The birds are beginning to move and they're all going to move. It's just going to take a, a moment of time. They'll all get triggered and take off. I predict that because that's what I've seen so many times. And I'm wrong. <laughs> Some are staying. They didn't move. But usually, yesterday they all left. And other times also, but today they didn't. So these ones are coming over to do a dance and scout another spot. Maybe these will move in a couple of minutes. And so then in the in Mount Tabor, God says, This is my beloved son. He said to Abraham, Take your beloved son and sacrifice him. And the Gospels explain that the transfiguration event was to strengthen the apostles, not to lose faith in Jesus when the crucifixion would happen. It was to prepare them, to motivate them for the hard sacrifice of Calvary. 
we're in Lent. We're a quarter of the way through Lent already, a good quarter. And so we're uh, heading along that road following Jesus to Calvary. And we have this contemplation of the glory that's inside of Jesus because he is truly God. That's our faith. So finally, they did leave. There's just a few left. Well, a couple, maybe a hundred or <laughs> two hundred. And the, the glory that's hidden inside of Jesus is transfigured and we see his divine nature shining forth. And so they have an experience of Jesus that transcends their normal daily experience of the carpenter here, who's hungry, who sleeps in the boat, he's that tired, who walks from one place to get to another. He doesn't go by DHL or by WhatsApp. He has to walk physically. He's human in every way, but now they see the divinity shining through. I'm going to, I think we're going way over time. So we leave it like this. Uh, I'm going to continue if you want. In the link, uh, uh, you can get to the Magla websites, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or in the homily link, you, from the link tree link, you can hear the homily, because I'm going to continue talking about this topic in an hour's time at Mass at, at 8.15. All the birds are gone, basically, except a few over there. And we'll continue later. But there's tremendous thought in this for us, tremendous reflection, how we are... This is our life, to grow back into a relationship with God. And many times it requires a lot of self-denial, a lot of yielding our own will, of going through pathways of suffering that happen to be in our life, to do with the patience and the hope that God is going to make everything work out. That's the, the source of hope we have from the whole biblical story. We are people of hope. And we are on a pilgrimage to the fulfillment of that hope. People, let's leave it there. God bless you. See you later, alligator. Say a prayer that I'll find the piece that fell off the gimbal, the magnetic piece, and be able to, to be back with that tomorrow for you, hopefully.